The Fallen have always occupied that grey area between Loyalist and Traitor. But with the return of the Lion, many of these Fallen have been folded back into the ranks of the Dark Angels under the moniker of the Redeem. As such, I thought it'd be interesting to explore this concept in miniature form and build a unit of these former Fallen Angels. So, let's build a squad of Redeemed. The basis of this build was the new Stern God squad from Leviathan, which Games Workshop sent me an early copy of. My reasoning behind this choice was not only the aesthetics, but also the fact that many Fallen had to become exceptionally proficient fighters just to survive. It's also not too much of a stretch to imagine that many of the Redeem's number would undergo the primaris process for the many physical benefits it bestows. After removing and cleaning the first Stern God Mini, my first task was to remove those push fit pins. They're not necessary if you're using glue and will get in the way of modifications. After being clipped away, the remaining surfaces were smoothed back with a knife and the torso was glued together. Being a push fit also meant that the minis didn't have any options on the sprue. So to fix this, I dipped into my bits box for an assault intercessor grenade arm and this intercessor arm holding the bolter one-handed. With the pins removed, these were simply glued to the shoulders as you would do a regular intercessor, resulting in a more varied pose than the original miniature. Being cut off from their parent chapter, the Fallen often had to make do with whatever equipment they could salvage. This meant a lack of more modern parts and a mismatch of armor marks. This seemed like a good aesthetic choice to continue into the stern guard, so a couple of the chunkier Mark III shoulder pads were glued to the arms. In addition to this lack of equipment, the Fallen also tended to sport their heresy era colors and designs. Again, this would help to separate these redeemed from the regular Dark Angels visually, whilst also giving them that, for want of a better phrase, retro look. This nightly theme was continued by modifying a Blade Guard Veteran's tilt shield slightly before attaching it to the chest. Alongside this, to continue the Grenadier theme, started by the arm, a grenade strap was taken from the Primus Reavers and glued into place. To finish off the miniature and to give it that distinctive Dark Angel's flare, a hooded head was attached to the model along with a Primaris power pack. For the second miniature, the same peg removal process was performed before gluing together the torso. While the regular bolt rifle on the last model had been swapped out, I wanted to retain the combi plasma gun that this model was armed with, albeit with a slight modification. To achieve this, the left hand holding the bolter was carefully clipped away and shaved back to leave a flat surface. When the combi plasma was glued to the torso, it gave the appearance that the gun was being held one-handed. Now you may be wondering what the point of this now awkward looking pose was. Well, it was all done so that a shield could be attached to the left arm. A Blade God Veteran shield arm was attached to the torso before dry fitting the shield against it. This just allowed me to adjust the arm's position so that the shields could properly fit against the gun. But the shield needed some modification first. To avoid any confusion with a Blade Guard Veteran, the usual ornate design was clipped away as much as possible before returning the shield back to a smooth surface with the laborious task of scraping and filing. Once this was done and the mountains of plastic snow had been cleaned up, a Dark Angels Veteran backpack topper was clipped down so the pole was removed and the back was made as flat as possible. After yet more slow adjustment, the Dark Angel icon was glued to the shield, not only giving it a slightly different appearance than its original, but also helping to solidify this marine as a member of the Dark Angels. From here, the rest of the model was pretty straightforward. Another veteran head was attached, followed up by the power pack, and finally a blade guard veteran shoulder pad. There was a little space at the back, so another detail from the Dark Angels veteran kit was attached to. The next model to build was the heavy bolter toting Stern Guard Veteran. This particular model remained largely unchanged, but the usual peg removal process was completed before assembly. While the heavy bolter had somewhat limited conversion options, I was still able to attach a knightly looking Blade Guard Veteran head alongside a few decorative details from the Dark Angels Veteran kit. Finally, the model was finished off with another Blade Guard tilt shield. The tab at the back was first removed before being attached to the torso. 
Normally this would go on the left shoulder pad, but due to the limited space here, it ended up on the right side instead. For the fourth model, the sculpted shoulder on the torso meant that while removing the arms wouldn't be as straightforward as simply clipping away some pegs, it wouldn't be impossible. After hacking away the lump of plastic with some clippers, a knife and a file, I was finally left with a regular looking torso. One detail that needed to be conveyed by these miniatures was their experience. Being cut off from supply lines meant that you only had what you could carry or scavenge, and so loading this model up with a range of weaponry seemed like an ideal way of depicting this. First, an intercessive right arm with a slung bolt rifle and pistol was attached alongside a knife-wielding arm from the assault intercessors. This particular model already had a pistol holster sculpted, but was also carrying a pistol in his hand. So, with that resourceful warrior mentality in mind, I simply glued another pistol holster to the model, but not before removing the grip to give it that empty look. The arm repose had exposed a gap in the chest, which was easily resolved with a large purity seal followed by another hooded head, some Mark III shoulder pads and the power pack, completing the fourth model of the squad. The final miniature, again, featured part of the arm sculpted onto the torso. So, to free up space, this was clipped and shaved away before gluing the torso together. From here, I actually followed the instructions for once and attached the combi melter and tilt shield to the left arm. While this model isn't officially a sergeant, in my opinion, having a defined leader of a unit helps to really finish off a squad. To denote this model as a sergeant, a blade guard veteran sword arm and shoulder pad was attached to the torso. It's technically a power sword, but it would serve well enough as a close combat weapon for rules purposes. To add some of that Dark Angel's flair, another veteran hooded head was attached along with a smaller tilt shield. This was taken from the Cataphracty Terminator's kit and instead of attaching it to the shoulder, it was instead placed on the belt. This particular Stone God's backpack already came equipped with a small icon, but to make way for a Dark Angel specific symbol, it was clipped away and shaved flat. The miniature was then finished off with another Dark Angel backpack topper. All that was left to do now was to attach the models to their bases, which is where Cobalt Keep comes in, the sponsors of this video. And instead of attaching my Stone Guard to their regular bases, I instead glued them to these almost identical looking 32mm Cobalt Keep bases. However, where they differ are in these round slots underneath, which are the perfect size for attaching the magnets that come with them. After securing the magnet in place with a little superglue, the models were glued to the base as well. Not only do these magnetized bases make it easy to store and display these minis, something that I'll be exploring later on in the video, it also allows them to be attached to these painting handles, which are also from Cobalt Keep. We have the Painting Hilt Pro that can have lights, magnifying glasses and clips attached to it, as well as these small hilts, which are great for painting up models in batches. The base simply clips onto the handles and is held in place by the magnets. I'll include links to all these below in the description, but now let's get to painting these redeemed. When it came to painting these redeemed angels, painting them in their original black armor scheme seemed to make the most sense. So everything was primed black. I used an airbrush for this, but a regular rattle can spray paint would have worked just as well. The black primer worked well enough as a base color for the armor, so no further base coats were needed for this and the highlights could begin immediately. Rather than opting for a typical grey to pick out the edge details, I instead opted for some cold corpse blue from the Tooth and Coats range. This paint was carefully applied to just the hard edges of the armour to create a thin line of paint which raised up these details from the darker panels of the armour. This greyish blue colour of this highlight would create a slightly cooler tone that would contrast nicely against the reds that would be applied later on. In addition to the edges, some small flecks were added across the armor to create the appearance of light damage and scratches. This is optional, but it does help to add that extra level of detail. Continuing with the armor highlights, some small spots of the lighter gravestone blue were applied. This paint was targeted to only the sharpest points, such as the corners where two edges converge, further lifting these points and creating a degree of extra detail. From here, the process of painting each section would remain the same. I would begin with a base coat, followed by a wash, before finishing off that section with a highlight. 
The first area that would be tackled in this way were the silver metallics, which were painted with Surcoat Silver. As a base coat, I mixed in a little water to slightly thin down the paint, which would allow it to flow across the surfaces more easily. After the first layer had dried, the second coat was applied, resulting in a both a smoother coverage and a more solid looking final color. Next was a wash. This had the same effect as a highlight, but it makes the edges look brighter in comparison to the darker shadows that the wash creates. For the step, the brown of Battle Mud Wash was used. It would not only darken the recesses, but also give them a grimier, dirtier look, feeding into that grizzled veteran aesthetic that was started earlier with the scratches in the armor. Finally, the metal details were highlighted with the bright silver of Mithril Blade. In conjunction with the previous wash and the shadows it created, it gave the edges some strong definition. The metallic areas were continued with focus being shifted to the brass and gold areas. These included the bolt casings and a few small trinkets, all of which were first base coated in some Spartan bronze. Battle Mud Wash was used once again, but this time its brown tone would complement the warmer brown tones of the golds and bronze. Finally, some glistening gold was applied to the edges of these areas, completing the metallics. As such, my paint water was replaced at this point to prevent cross-contamination of metal flakes in to my other paints. The process for the remaining areas was largely the same, so let's speed things up a little and just go through the paints that I used. The red areas, like the various symbols, the lining of the tabards, and the weapon stocks were all tackled with a base coat of Sanguine Scarlet. A wash of Oblivion Black was then applied, particularly around those defined panels on the weapons. These details were then picked out with an edge highlight of Demon Red. As a slight divergence from the established process, some Blood Angel's red contrast paint was thinned down with a little contrast medium and applied over the top of all of those red areas. This glaze would help to blend the shadows and highlights together a little, whilst also boosting the intensity of that red. For the other side of the tabards and hoods, I began with some Dust Bowl. They were then washed with some Archaic Sepia, a slightly lighter tan than the previously used Battle Mud Wash. Finally, the edges of these areas were picked out with some Temple Stone. Again, a few scratches and scuffs were applied here too, in order to give the cloth that slight worn look. The various pouches and straps were then tackled with some of the reddish brown of Cuirass Leather and then washed with more Battle Mud Wash. The edges were then picked out with some lines and scratches, which were all applied with some boar hide. For this next step, I used some Dungeon Stone Grey in two distinct ways. First, as a base coat over any of the parchment, and also as an edge height across the remaining black details, like the segments between the armor plates. The parchment areas were then coated with some Oblivion Black Wash. Next up, some Carcaridon Grey was also used in a few different ways. It was used as a highlight across the grey parchment, as an extreme highlight to the black areas, and as a base coat. The base coat was focused across any details that I intended to be painted white. These areas mainly included parts of the Dark Angel symbols, as well as some of the smaller tilt shields. Finally, Carcaridon Grey was used to replicate that checkerboard style of old school Dark Angels. To achieve this, the paint was thinned out with a little more water than had been used in the earlier base coats. This would allow the paint to be applied in a fine line, which I took advantage of to mark out the checkerboard pattern by evenly spacing some horizontal and vertical lines. Once marked out, an alternating pattern of squares were blocked in with the grey. If you ever spilled during any of these points, you can easily clean them up with a little black paint. The areas that had been base coated with the called and grey were then highlighted with some white star. For the checkerboard, the application of this white paint was limited to just the top and right edges of each square. In order to bring back a little green into these dark angels, the wax of the purity seals, as well as the lenses and the helmet, were all base coated with emerald green, washed with orc flesh, and then highlighted with ethereal green. For the one model not wearing a helmet, the skin was base coated with dwarven skin. This was then followed up with some flesh wash. And finally, an highlight of alvin skin, which completed the painting of the miniatures. But there were still a few extra details to add, mainly in the form of decals. Before these could be added though, the surfaces needed to be prepped with a layer of gloss varnish. 
This smooth gloss finish would create a much better surface in which to apply decals to. I saw some decals from the Dark Angels Veteran kit which were cut out and left to soak in some water until the transfers started lifting up from the backing paper. From here, the decals were carefully applied to the shoulder pads and shield and then left to dry. But to create that painted on look, I would need to use some Microsol. This mild solvent can be painted onto decals where it will soften them and allow them to conform to the surface beneath. You might need to do this a couple of times to get the best effect, but just allow the Microsoft to fully dry between applications. With the models themselves completed, the surface of the base needed a little color and texture added to it. I settled on a fairly generic muddy ground and to create this, I used some of AK Interactive's Dark Earth Texture Paste. This was layered across all the bases in a couple of layers, making sure that great care was taken not to spill onto the models themselves. That texture was then brought out by first applying a wash of battle mud over everything. And then after allowing the wash to fully dry, picking out the raised texture with a dry brush of ancient forest. From here, all that was left to do now was to clean up the base's rims with Doom Death Black, seal in everything with a coat of satin varnish, clean up the contact points for the shield before gluing it into place, and finally add a few tufts of grass across the base, which left me with these. And here we have the completed unit of Redeemed Stern Guard. With everything completed, I'm left with a unit that is still recognizable as being of the Dark Angels, but is distinct enough in their design to help them stand apart, in a similar capacity to how the Deathwing or Ravenwing do. It was also fun to expand this concept out into a full unit, rather than just a single model. It allowed me to explore a wide array of modifications, whilst also demonstrating that it doesn't take a huge change to each model to make them distinct. If you're a little apprehensive about the cutting and tweaking required with these monopose models, then at the time of recording, you could always wait until this kit is inevitably released as a multi-part standalone. When that will be, however, well, your guess is as good as mine. As I mentioned earlier, these magnetized bases not only make it easy to paint the models on them, but they also allow you to display your finished miniatures safely and securely. Cobalt Keep also offers these display cases which feature a metal base, allowing your magnetized minis to be held firmly in place. This means they're not only great for display, but also for transporting. If you want to check these out for yourself, you can find all the relevant links below. A big thank you to Cobalt Keep for sponsoring this video. However, my biggest thanks goes to my Patreon supporters and channel members, the ever generous people who help these videos keep going. Especially my expert tier and above supporters who are Jonathan Hart, Maciej Savitsky, Morgan, Swedsman, Tim, Daniel Dowling, Immaterial Creations, Joachim Folk, Johans, Jonathan Senstead, Mr. Grimm, Pale Juice, and The Googles. And my sergeant level channel members who are Fair Statement, Mr. Jared Hess 95, Nerdington Paints, Mark Taylor, Well Tussler, and Philip Poyer. If you're interested in supporting me, you can hit the join button below or find a link to my Patreon in the description. Supporters get a whole host of benefits, including ad-free access to my videos, sneak peeks, a private Discord channel, and exclusive merchandise. Speaking of merchandise, I also have a few t-shirts and mugs up for sale featuring designs drawn by me. You can check those out by following the links below or by going over to PeteTheWarGamer.com. So until next time, thanks for watching and goodbye.